So if you're thinking about imagery in the early Buddhist texts, uh, one of the, the ways that the Buddha used these imagery was to talk about very complicated things that are beyond words. And of course, for many of us, meditation is beyond words, right? Something that is indescribable. So how do you talk about meditation? And the Buddha used a lot of images to, to do that. So for people in the room, you can see here on the screen, that there's a picture of a tiny little bird. Do you know what kind of bird it is? If you're reading the text, you've got an advantage. <laughs> it's a quail. And quails, of course, are tiny little things. Have you ever seen a quail egg? Yeah. So small. And quails themselves are very small and, and, of course, very fragile. So one of the similes that the Buddha used, an image that he used to teach about meditation was this image of a quail. And you find it in the Majjhima Nikaya. Do I have the Majjhima Nikaya here? Middle-length discourses, Majjhima Nikaya, the sutta number 128, the Upakalesa Sutta, the sutta about defilements, obscurations. And in this sutta, the Buddha is talking to people about meditation, what works, what doesn't. If you've ever meditated, Understanding what works and what doesn't is what leads to wisdom in your meditation. You want to know, is this going towards peace and stillness? Is this leading away from peace and stillness? If you don't recognize what's going on, you never learn, you'll never progress along the spiritual path. We're actively involved in our meditation. And the Buddha always encouraged people to be present and react, respond to what's going on in their meditation. And again, coming back to that point I made earlier about the difference between early Buddhist meditation, as it's taught in the suttas, and some forms of meditation practice that we've been taught in the modern Buddhist period. Many of us are told, don't do anything, just sit there, do nothing. Whereas the Buddha didn't teach like this. He encouraged you to be responsive, aware, to know what's going on so that you react according to the situation. So this image of the quail, the Buddha says, there's times in your meditation practice when you might become overly energetic. And here perhaps the Buddha is talking about things like restlessness, too much energy in the mind. Perhaps you've experienced this in your meditation where there's just like all this energy bubbling away and the mind is really active and alert and looking for something to do. And restlessness is one form of this over, over energy in the mind. Uh, you might become really tense and tight in your practice of your experiences, or you're putting too much effort into your practice. You're pushing yourself too hard. You're really striving to get somewhere with your practice. Too much force. It's very fragile. And so the Buddha said that when you're like this, Imagine that you're holding a little baby quail in your hand. If you hold it too tightly with too much force, too much energy, you're going to kill that little bird. You're going to squish it to death, right? So this, of course, is what you're doing to your mind. When you're pushing, striving, when there's too much energy in your mind, you're pushing and striving using so much force, you're actually squishing your mind. Another extreme is if you were to hold that little bird and your hands were too loose, it would fly away. And this is like when we have some lack of energy in the mind. That's the sloth and torpor where you're like this and you're not holding the mind firmly enough to be mindful and you're sliding off into delusion and sleepiness. So these are two extremes, right? Holding the bird too tightly, you kill the bird, you destroy your mind, your meditation. Holding it too loosely, you allow it to fly away, you completely lose track of your meditation subject. So the answer, of course, surprise, surprise, it's a middle path. Between these two extremes, 
where we hold the mind just right. So this is something that only you can discern for yourselves. Bhante Kala can't stand behind you and say a bit more energy, a bit less energy. Mm-hmm. Right, hold it there. You need to know this and you need to respond in your meditation practice, right? If you don't respond, if you don't react, then the next thing you know, or up you get, you're doing something else. So you need to know what's going on in your mind. And there's many, hopefully we'll get a chance to look at them later, There's many similes that talk about this. And again, I just want to point out that the Buddha taught meditation in a way that was very dynamic, very responsive to what's going on in the mind. Another image used commonly is the image of fire. Sometimes you need to get the fire going. Sometimes you need to put the fire out. Another image is the image of a lute or a a harp. If the harp strings are too loose, boom, no sound. If they're too tight, boom, crack, the string breaks. So it needs to be just right to get this beautiful sound. So these are images, similes that the Buddha used to talk about meditation. They make so much sense. When you're sitting in meditation, you need to know, how is my little baby quail mind? Mm-hmm. Am I squishing it? Am I not holding it enough? You've got to get it just just right. And when you've got it just right, it's like you're in charge of your mind and you don't have these extremes. And then when it's just right, the meditation proceeds really nicely. So we're going to do 20 minutes of meditation. And we're going to use this kind of image to keep us aware of what's going on in our mind. Okay? Right. So let's take a comfortable posture. And so even in our posture, right, middle path, we've got to be comfortable but not too loose. We don't want to fall asleep, be on the couch, kind of sprawled out. If we lie down, we'll fall asleep. If we're too relaxed, we'll fall asleep. But if we're too uptight, we won't get any peace. We won't get any kindness in the mind. So we need to have this posture which is just right, comfortable enough to relax, but not too comfortable that we fall asleep. So we want to be upright, but not uptight. And then we allow ourselves to let go of the world outside. You can close your eyes, start to shut that experience of the world down a little bit. So we let go of the world outside so that we can be here, present, aware, and relaxed. So check in with your body. How is it feeling? How are you sitting here? Are you comfortable? Are you at ease in the body? Or is there areas of tightness and tension? If you find some tension, tightness, if you can just let it go, relax, soften, release the muscles so that your body can become more at ease. What about your face? Are you squeezing your forehead together, forcing, pressing the mind 
Are your lips tight? Is your jaw clenched? Can you perhaps soften and relax the face so that you can be calm and peaceful, not trying too hard? Relax through the body, allow the body to feel good. And it's the same with our mind. Let go, let go of those things that make the mind tense. Let go of work, all those problems of the day, all of the agitation and excitement of your life. Let it go, relax. Let it slide away so that you can be calm and peaceful. but not too relaxed, not too loose. We're developing mindfulness, seeing what's going on. We need to be relaxed, but aware, present, mindful, but comfortable, at ease in our mind. Now that we've been relaxed and developed some mindfulness, we turn our awareness to the breath coming in, the breath going out. We're aware, this breath coming in, aware of the breath going out. We're mindful. Mindfully breathing in, mindfully breathing out. But we're balanced. 
we're not tight, hyper-focused. We're not loose, unaware. For the remainder of the meditation, just experimenting what is the right amount of effort required for you to maintain awareness of the breath without becoming overly agitated or restless, tense or tight, without becoming lax, losing awareness or becoming sleepy. So have a play, find where the mind is aware but relaxed, that middle path where the mind is present but comfortable. So see how you go for the next 10 minutes.
You're too tense. The mind will feel tight. You'll feel pressure in your forehead, squeezing your eyes, your temples, clenching your jaw. Your shoulders feel tight and tense. If you're too loose, you're falling asleep. You've lost the object. You're thinking about this and that, wandering mind. But if you're balanced, you're aware of the breath. It's easy to watch the breath. If you're calm, peaceful, alert, mindful. And so as we come towards the end, we take this opportunity, still with our eyes closed, to review our practice, to see what happened in our mind. How do you feel now? Is it different from when you began? Why? Did you see the process of your meditation? Did you develop some mindfulness? Did the mind wander away? If so, why? Did you become tired or tense? agitated, restless? If so, why? How did you respond? What did you do that led to peace? and mindfulness, and what led away from peace and mindfulness. So by reviewing in this way, we understand the process of meditation. We understand the nature of our mind, and we learn how to train our mind to come out of suffering and to have happiness and freedom. Very good. So now you can relax your awareness. And when you're ready, opening the eyes, coming out of your meditation, So you see how difficult it is to maintain that balance of the mind, right? There's times when you need to respond to what's going on. If you're starting to fall asleep and you don't amp up the energy a little bit, what's going to happen? You're just going to fall asleep. If you're starting to get really tense and tight and you don't chill out a bit, what's going to happen? You're just going to be, it's going to be a miserable meditation session. So that's the simile of the quail. It's very useful, right? It's very useful to remember every time you come to meditate, how is my meditation going? Am I 
too tight, too loose? Where's the middle balance part of this meditation? Is that string of my mind too tight? Is it too loose? Am I getting that beautiful note that comes with good meditation? So these images that the Buddha used to talk about meditation are very profound. They're very, they're very beautiful things for us to remember and incorporate into our learning about our mind and our practice. And that's why he taught them. So before we finish, I want you to think about your meditation animal. Maybe you're not a little quail. Maybe you're a monkey swinging through the trees. Maybe you're an elephant that is able to remember the teachings. Maybe you're a uh, happy little panda. What is your meditation animal? Have a little think about it. What's your meditation animal? I remember once I did this activity and someone said they were like an eagle. They felt like they could see things so clearly from above. Another guy said he was like a pig, just always looking for something to eat, <laughs> always thinking about food. Uh, sometimes I, I, I feel like I'm a little wombat, just kind of like burrowing, getting comfortable and warm. What about you? What's your meditation and all? Yes, sir. Oh, very I'm becoming a donkey. Donkey! <laughs> Why? Because if you never meditated while you were young and you left it too late, yeah. it is too late. No, it's never too late. It just requires more work. And that donkey, stubborn donkey, <laughs> They are trainable. You've got to have the right carrot. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, donkey, I don't think you're that bad, but good. Anyone else? Patricia? Maybe a cat. Ah, cats are the perfect meditators, right? Well, because, you know, one minute they're kind of really active and jumping off after something, the next minute they're like crashed out. Not too much in the middle. <laughs> Yes, true, yeah. But, you know, when a cat is focused, mm. they are focused to the uh, extent that they're not concerned with anything else going on, right? There's that real fixation that they get when they're stalking. Is that the kind of mind you need to watch the breath? No. No? What about when they're purring and they're really happy and they're just, like, blissed out? There's sometimes when we'll experience that kind of mindfulness that we need, that really, really sharp mindfulness that really sees what's going on. There's other times when, we, when we're just blissing out. So cats are a good meditation animal to recollect, actually. Anyone else? Oh, really? Are we just shy or are we uncreative? <laughs> I, was, I was going to get you to draw them, but I'm just feeling a vibe from this group that maybe not. So I won't I won't push the, I won't push the limits, but just have a think about it. what 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 kind of and the reason I'm asking you to do this is not because I want you to, um, not that I want you to come up with something, you know, that's going to blow us away. But I want you to start thinking about your meditation practice and your spiritual path in a creative way. so that you can think about it in different terms. When we start to do this thing of like, what's your meditation animal or what's your meditation colour or whatever, where we're starting to link up parts of our brain that, you know, this colour does not mean this, but in our brain somehow it's connected. This animal is not like this, but in our brain somehow it's connected. And that's what the imagery in the Buddha's teachings does for us. It starts to connect things in different ways so that we can think about them differently. 
you still seem suspicious. I'm going to ask one more time for an animal, any animal. Dog. A dog. Why, sir? <clears throat> Always wanting to run around and find very raw aspects of the experience and having to be reined in. It's having to be reined in, right? And that's good to know that your mind is a little bit like a doggy so that you can train it properly, right? So it's good to know what our mind is doing. Like even if it feels weird and funny, oh, yeah, my mind's like a dog. Well, at least you know actually it's running around. I need to bring it in. Like that's good to know. That means an advancement in your practice. One more. Whippets are pretty crazy. Ah. See? That's right. And doing nothing, sleeping. Yeah. Yeah. So you see how it's good to think about your spiritual practice. I try to encourage you all to become reflective spiritual practitioners so that you're actually aware of what you're doing in your spiritual practice. If you want to make progress on the spiritual path, you're going to have to tune in to this thing, this stuff that we do. You're going to have to become more aware of yourself. We don't look at ourselves enough. We don't just sit and ponder our mind, how we do things. Sometimes when it comes to our meditation practice, we just come and we just start meditating. And when and then when we get up, we just go. We never spend time with our meditation and our meditating mind. We never understand. And for that reason, I meet so many people who have been meditating for a very long time but have made very little process progress because they aren't aware of their own mind. So this is why these kinds of things where we become reflective practitioners is actually very useful. might seem a bit nonsensical, but it's a powerful way to understand your mind. And that's the important thing if you want to make progress on the spiritual path.